Hi folks, the ways to use 3D printers in a machine shop. This is the perfect day to start this because there used to be a Haas VM3 right here. And just yesterday, we picked it up on skates, we moved it over to here. But come look at our 3D model. And so you'll have to excuse it because the shop is a mess because on Monday we got two more machines coming. And this is our 132nd scale 3D printed model of our machine shop. We picked 132nd because that's the Lego scale, so it actually works really well if you want to put a minifigure in there to represent yourself. But this lets us magically move machines around to get a feel of what's going to go where. Decent for checking things like forklift clearance, getting raw material through, and you can even take it to the next level by 3D printing, or in this case, we'd laser cut a base that represents the radius of the swing door so that you can always have enough room to open the electronics door or say, pull out a coolant tank. It's also super trippy because if you actually bend down and look through one of the man doors, it, you can actually see the shop. It's a completely different perspective and it's really cool. On our Haas lathe, we printed this. It's a simple bushing that we put into our subspindle collet because I, I had this idea of whether a sort of temporary light support, think of it like a dead center or a live center, would help with how we were parting off something. Ends up that it didn't really work, but the fact that I could model this infusion in under a minute, just send it to the printer, it meant no time invested in getting this part to be able to touch it, feel it, hold it in your hand, and look at how it works. Uh, and if you're new to 3D printing, two of the things that you may have heard about are that it's either expensive or takes a long time. We've had a number of different 3D printers. The one that we're using now is a Prusa. It's $1,000, absolutely a great printer, especially for that price. They come standard with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. That's great and will let you do fine and detailed things like threads. If you're trying to rough out and just print something quickly, upgrading to a 0.6, 0.8, or even one millimeter nozzle, it's gonna give you rougher looking prints, but it can print things really quickly. We've compromised on a 0.6 right now, which is a kind of a good balance of, again, getting things done quicker, but enough resolution for them to be useful for what we need. Our subspindle moves on a set of these linear rails, and we want to avoid dinging these like we already did once if a part gets parted off and it doesn't go into the parts catcher. And so we printed these covers, inexpensive and quick, and they just slide right over. If you happen to use your subspindle and you forget to take them out, all that happens is they just, is they slide off. One of the first jobs we ran on this machine were some two and a half inch diameter D2 tool steel pins and our parts catcher door didn't open far enough. It's these two pieces here that dictate how far that door opens. This is the Haas factory piece. We just 3D printed a larger one. And finally over here at the lathe, we use a lot of Capto on our turrets. It gives us the ability to quick change tools and to leave them set up in their holder. And the idea here is actually more than this, it's to build out more of these that are labeled and numbered. Very similar to our S-Tool system, which I'll come to in a second, but basically inexpensive way to print a Capto block that we can then leave on our lathe cart. Our S-Tool system is an awesome way that we use to organize and, and standardize tools that we use a lot and we want to leave set up. This happens to be a laser cut version, but we realized after we made this one, way better to 3D print it. So we've got the model for this up on our website. We'll put a card here to the whole S-Tool system. You can also buy or 3D print the tool tags and they slip into there. But the beauty of leaving tools set up is I don't have to look for the holder or the collet and I can build out my cam tool library that's got the correct holder, clearances, stick out, tool data, etc. And then what we do is use bins like this so for example s s180 i know where there's extra versions of the tool or say an insert tool i can leave the extra insert packs grease the wrench for it etc speaking of s tools uh, we have a tool presetter. It's one of our most precise pieces of equipment and it's okay to leave this out on the shop floor, but we want to avoid dust or debris getting inside of that spindle taper. So we 3D printed a cover. This is the BT30 version and we've got the Cat40 version right there. We still use Heimers on our Tormach machines, and if you want to find the gauge length of a Heimer, you've got to measure it when the tip is compressed. And we measured on our Speroni, but we still need a way to compress the tip. So check this out. We 3D printed this two-piece 
part, we 3D printed the threads right into it. Uh, this is an example of where you would want the 0 0.4, kind of the standard factory nozzle. And this piece slides over the Heimer collar. We've got to thread our tip in. And now this cap allows us to preload the Heimer tip correctly at zero. We can then place it in our Speroni. And we now have the gauge length. Microscope stand. If you aren't using a shop microscope, uh, you have to consider buying one. This is this thing's like 110 bucks. It is amazing what you can use it for, uh, especially when you're inspecting tooling. But when you're inspecting an end mill, especially under high magnification, it really helps to have that end mill stable and to be able to rotate that tool. So this little fixture, again, we'll have the model uh, to download this and print this yourself in the video description, allows you to place the end mill like so or up on an angle. Okay, this one's cool. Super complicated part. When I was done with op one, I still had a giant chunk of material down here at the bottom. I had no really good datums left on here. So I had this idea, uh, courtesy of Rob Lockwood, to bolt on some material. And once that material was bolted on, and I'm still in my op one setup, I could machine a feature into that part. And that would give me good datums that I could use when I rotated the part into op Two. We'll have a whole video dedicated on this workflow, but what I wanted to do was test that idea out. So before I machine something, we quickly 3D printed this fixture. It's got a boss that locates into this ring, and it's got a couple of clearance pieces of geometry to handle the very strange nature of this generative design part. And sure enough, that told me that this is gonna work great. So very little time on the front end, 3D printed it. That then let me see the couple changes I wanted to make and then we actually machined the real version. Our fifth axis base on our UMC, it has these cavities and we wanted to plug them so that chips and coolant don't get in there. So Ed came up with this idea, which is genius because you can download this model off fifth axis website and then we just 3D printed these plugs that sit in there and they just look perfect the way they're tapered and cut. And that's the amazing thing about the world that we live in. Anytime you're thinking about 3D printing something, check thingiverse.com and grabcad.com because there's a decent chance that it's something that you were looking to print has already been modeled by somebody and is out there and free to download. Uh, in this case, we, you can also just download solid models off the manufacturer's website. We bring those into Fusion, 3D print it. We like these TTS racks that we put onto the machine, but when you buy them from Tormach, they're just sheet metal, so the tools will flop around in there. So 3D print some backers that you can screw or rivet or glue in there. These happen to be the laser cut version. We've done the 3D printed version uh, as well, and that gives your tool a nice solid fit when you slide them in and out. Colored plugs for your fixture plates. We love these because it lets us label and color code setups and fixturing locations. For a long time, we 3D printed these. We now are able to make them and sell them in high enough volume where we can have some of these injection molded. But if you wanna do your own color or your own size, 3D print in whatever rainbow of color you want. And I find colors so much easier to follow than trying to look at a number or a grid system. Haas makes an awesome air hose handle for their machines. We wanted them on our Tormach, so we printed one. And last for us, but not least, are shallower bins. Now these are all factory shallower bins, but so many folks have done really cool things printing their own sizes, color, and shape, size, organization, storage bins. It's still relatively inexpensive, and the ability to print one with your own name or number or nomenclature in there is just genius. You can even print these so that they stack up. Absolutely love it. Jay Pearson at Pearson Workholding has always been an inspiration on manufacturing workflows and being smart about how you run a manufacturing company. He needed a better solution for how to install the locking detent balls on his pro and mini pallet systems. So he 3D printed a jig that has magnets pressed into it that hold the balls captive while that retaining clip, spring, and other hardware are installed. An awesome example of a practical use of a 3D printed part. Card here to the full tour video where you can see how Pearson machines and assembles their pallet systems. And here is an 
awesome set of slides from a fellow named Tyler Reed, who's a manufacturing application manager at Go Engineer, with by far the most comprehensive list of examples of 3D printing in a machine shop or manufacturing environment. Everything from alignment fixtures, traditional fixtures, soft draws, drill jigs, assembly fixtures, inspection, general shop tools, organization, and even tools to help with safety. We appreciate Tyler sending this in. And if you want to download this full PowerPoint presentation, it will be in next month's chip rag. So those are our tips. I'm now super excited to introduce Jan. We first met Jan when he submitted what is probably one of the most amazing things I've ever seen on the internet, which was his TIE Fighter build. Card here to that video unbelievable but he's a super sharp fellow who is going to share with you a number of his really good uses for a 3d printer in a machine shop thank you john for introducing me also guys welcome to the shops today we're going to talk about 3d printed items in the workshop environment since i have no idea where to start um, i may introduce you to project icebreaker have a look at this you probably know the situation. Someone is coming to your shop and you don't want to cut to the chase right away. That's why I built Project Icebreaker in the first place. All you have to do is print the file, fill a regular balloon and connect the two. You will get everyone's attention with this right away and everyone, technical background or not, will go something like this. You've basically created a very easy, but yet efficient air bearing. Fun fact, this exact bearing with around 0.3 bars or 5 psi of pressure is already lifting its own weight and doesn't starve until you add some 60 grams on top of it. Isn't that impressive and oddly satisfying to watch? But yeah, what do you do just a moment after, when the awkward silence strikes again? Exactly. You show them how to keep everyone's favorite equipment clean and accurate. This isn't a 123 block, we guys use the 204080 block. But sure enough, both of them can and should be stored in a very similar manner. Don't throw them in the rack or another storage. Just print them on cheap and easy to use cover. Okay, first off, you know the problem. You want to use your spindle through coolant drill, but have to hold it in a collet chuck? So up to now there's only one solution to this problem, to buy a sophisticated colored block which is blocking off the coolant so the coolant passages get pressurized. I did have the same problem so I quickly designed and printed this tool which blocks off all the coolant coming through the collet. I guess this might not be fitted very well to high pressure coolant systems. I didn't test to around 10 bars or 140 psi and it held up just fine. For setting up raw stock to a very specific length I have to end up using three hands because I don't have a foot switch. Also it tends to pull the raw stock inwards the chuck so setting something up very precisely is kind of impossible. It has become somewhat of a routine whenever I'm setting up a job on the CNC lathe and I do the cat work infusion. First thing I do is to design some fixture to set it off to a certain length from the chuck. And while that is printing I can do cat work and mostly they finish at the same time. Also I'm building a collection of the standard sizes um, I tend to use the most. And uh, later on I added the screw at the back so if I do have the right diameter, I can set the, the length to any value I want. This little device saved me so much time over the years. As you can see, it fits behind the jaws with only 2 millimeters of space, but it held up around 1000 clampings up to now. It acts as a small spindle stop and enabled me to produce these parts with a very close tolerance lengthwise.
Okay, speaking of lathe tooling. So let's imagine you do have your DRO and you can set in various tool offsets for each tool. So the question is, how do you label them? Or something like this. Whatever I tried in the past, it always seemed to be more, more of a pain than a relief. So what I ended up doing was to design these simple parts, which you can just throw at your tooling. They will stick wherever you want to have them. They're super easy to make. I used some silicon molding to fill in the numbers to give them a bit more contrast and a 10 by one neodymium magnet in the back. And I tend to put them wherever the least amount of chips get or where I do have the best visibility. In terms of holding your tooling for the mill, you got the most various choices, ranging from very bad to very expensive. So my favorite solution to this are these guys. I did design them like three years ago and they're just made of simple PLA, which I had at hand at that time. And they are still holding strong, even though with a big face mill in there. What about the infamous power feed adapter? Also check out these templates for drilling and cutting purposes. I've designed and printed so many over the years and it saved me so much time. Also, for just one off production, these work perfectly. If you have to drill hundreds of holes with these, uh, it's a good idea to maybe glue in some, some metal rods or some metal guides or bushings just to prevent them from wearing out too fast. Or just print more of them in the first place and use one after another. They just cost you pennies. That's okay, I guess. Have a look at this embossing stamp. 3D printed bending tools are becoming really popular for prototyping and small series production. We could do a whole video just on this topic. This particular stamp is for adding braille signs to paper or cardboard. Last but not least, I want to show you some short clips of everyday items I gathered around the shop. There are a lot more, but you will see those eventually in part 2. Like this silicon mold. This technique gets used so often to coat or embed something in silicone and it's super handy on top of being dirt cheap. Or if you need some kind of a sign around the shop. as well as construction prototypes, unique solutions to hang your posters, or simple but awesome add-ons to your power strip. As well as really unique business cards. And many, many more. Honestly, thank you for inviting me over. That's gonna be it for today, folks. Take care, see you soon.